Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome, panelists. I appreciate your time today. If you would all introduce yourselves and give a brief bio about what you do. Okay, starting here. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Peggy Morton, and I'm the Assistant Dean of Field Learning and Community Partnerships here at the school. Um, I've been at NYU a total of 25 years, part-time and full-time, and um, in, always in some field learning capacity. I also teach. I have taught uh, HB1 and 2 here for many years, not currently. Um, and so, but prior to my academic career, I had done a number of things, and um, um, when I practiced out in the field, I, I most recently was in the field of gerontology and also hospice care. So I think that's why I've been asked to be on this panel. I don't uh, do any work in the actual agency world anymore, um, but I certainly have my finger on the pulse of agencies because of the field learning area. So, um, so yeah. That's me. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Gerbino. I'm on the faculty here. Um, I direct our Westchester campus up at Sarah Lawrence uh, College, and I'm the director of the Zelda Foster Fellowship and Flow in Palliative and End of Life Care. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the intersection between palliative and end of life care and working with older adults. I still do clinical work privately. Um, Palliative care is a field that you can work with people of all ages, but certainly a cohort in addition is um, working with older adults. Good afternoon. My name is Margaret Woods. I'm a recent graduate, class of 2015. Um, I currently work at Carter Burden Center for the Aging um, on the Upper East Side, and I'm in the case management unit. We deal mostly with homebound seniors and I'm um, providing case management and assistance. And I am also a Zelda Foster Fellow in Palliative and End-of-Life Care. And um, I'm happy to be back. Uh, I'm Molly Fogel. I am a grad of this school, Silver School, from 2006. Uh, I am currently working as the Director of Educational and Social Services for the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Um, I've been working in a clinical capacity doing education and training for paraprofessionals around how we can ensure our best practices, not only with the aging population, but all of those who are in working with the aging population, so our professionals, as well as our care partners, families, and so on. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be back. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you could be here. Margaret, can you start us off? Did you come into Silver knowing that you wanted to work with the aging population? Well, it started out when I first came to Silver, I had two populations I had in mind. One was teenagers and the other was older adults. By the end of my first semester, I decided, and because I also have a teenager, I decided I didn't want to work with teenagers. <laughs> um, but seriously though, being, I've always been involved with older adults, whether it was in my, my own life, um, having, my, having the influence of my great-grandmother and my grandmother on my life growing up. So that intergenerational dynamic that you have with that was always a part of my life. And I looked around at my family and realized that about 90% of my family are now age 70, really 70 and over. So. I think that I always wanted to work with older adults, and it wasn't until I came to Silver and was in this environment and I worked at self-help during my first internship that it really solidified it for me. Thank you. Molly, do you have additional credentials outside of your MSW to work with the aging population? So uh, I actually don't have any additional credentials. I do. I am trained as a psychodynamic therapist, um, and I work uh, in terms of the clinical work with this population, which I feel as though with the great training that we've gotten here at NYU, as well as the, uh, the training I've gotten along the years, that to be able to work with this population and the variety of different issues that pop, that pop up, family dynamics, communication issues, resistance, uh, all of those components that we've been able to um, been able to work out quite nicely with this population just using the great skills that I have. Yeah. Great. 
Susan, can you please speak about the intersection of palliative care and geriatrics, as well as the key things to keep in mind? Okay. Um, so I gave everyone a, a handout about palliative care and end-of-life care because there's such confusion about what it is. Um, so palliative care um, is for anyone from child, we even now have perinatal palliative care, pediatric palliative care, all the way through to older adults, um, for anyone with a serious and chronic illness. Um, you do not have to be terminally ill or dying, and then um, many people that work in palliative care are not working necessarily with someone who's dying. So I think that's where the confusion has been. So hospice, which is for, is end-of-life care, so hospice is a subset of palliative care, but palliative care is the overall umbrella. Um, and it's a particularly good match for working with older adults because it is holistic care. It includes a team, social work, physician, nurse, chaplain, PT, OT, speech. Um, and the whole idea of palliative care is to keep people out of the hospital, um, to keep them safe. Um, and if you work with older adults, most of them will tell you they would prefer to age in place where they live, where they've been living. Um, and probably the number one problem that brings older adults into nursing home and hospitals is falls. Mm -hmm. And palliative care, um, has, when they're working with older adults, is also working very carefully on fall prevention. Mm -hmm. um, the other sort of key things that are important to think about for palliative care um, is, the, is the idea that one of the main thrusts of palliative care is, is taking care of pain, what we call total pain. So it also includes the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual, but it certainly includes physical pain. And many people are told by their physicians, well, you're an older person and pain goes with, goes with the territory. Um, which is not true. Um, people do not have to be in severe pain. And so we're looking um, to really educate physicians as well as ourselves about the need for pain. And probably the elders are probably the most under-treated for pain. If they have dementia, they are really practically unmedicated for pain. And uh, particularly um, women of color um, are amongst the, the least well regulated for pain. Um, so there's health disparities in palliative care, there's health disparities in healthcare across the, and certainly health disparities in terms of pain. So if you're going to work with older adults, you need to know how to do a pain assessment. You need to have to look around someone's home to see if there are area rugs and things that they can fall. Um, you need to attend to, obviously, spiritual and psychosocial um, and to think about palliative care if they have a chronic illness. It could be a chronic illness like diabetes, um, which brings lots of other kinds of issues. Obviously cancer, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure, and obviously any of the dementing illnesses, Alzheimer's being one of the dementing illnesses. So um, palliative care, and we are in a city that's rich with palliative care, Almost every hospital has palliative care. The VAs, uh, the Veterans Administration, where, where Margaret worked last year um, as a student, has palliative care. And lots of outpatient, even aging agencies are beginning to educate their social workers about palliative care. Hospice care is, I think, much more understood. It's for people who are dying. You have to have a six month or less prognosis. It's primarily delivered in the home. But palliative care is the one that's most people get confused about, and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy, what are qualities employers seek in a geriatric social worker? Um, well, you're probably better off asking those who employ them, but I would say, um, I mean, I can just, you know, speak to when we even send students out to for internships in, in ger gerontology is that I, I think that most, um, most, most employers and certainly most supervisors in those settings are interested in people who are interested in gerontology. Um, and I think that that's a real deficiency, I have to say, or a lack of, 
of you know um, popularity. Certainly, I've seen among students um, and young people, or not even young people, but young new graduates going out into the field. Uh, there hasn't been the kind of interest in older adults that there has been, or is, or there is with youth, with adolescents, with some other populations. Um, I think this is most unfortunate since I come from that background and I love the work and I think it's incredibly valuable work. But anyway, we have some educating to do in terms of that. So I, I think that, that um, I would guess, and, and maybe those of you who work in the field can speak to this as well, but I think employers want to see that there's motivation to work with the older adult population, that there is a feeling of um, optimism and that it's not just a doom and gloom kind of situation, which is what I think you know, the misperception is amongst a lot of you know people that it's going to be very depressing. It's all nursing homework. It's all death and dying. Um, and so some of those you know those myths around what the work is like, I think you know really have to be dispelled. And um, and yes, I, I think that that's probably the key thing. But I think that my colleagues could probably speak to that better, um, being in the field. Would you like to I'm happy to jump in if I could. Yeah. So um, we actually are, are looking for a social worker right now to work at the Alzheimer's Foundation. And, and recently, I, I've been able to hire a really fantastic team. And I, I'm, I'm, I always look for, yes, somebody who has had the interest or has shown the interest in gerontology, but really somebody who's a good clinician, who's open-minded and diverse to be able to work with the variety of different issues that are going to pop up when you're talking about this population. So yes. There's the individual, and in our case, living with dementia or another related illness. But there's also those individuals who are having a hard time dealing with the continued loss of seeing somebody slip away day after day while they're still living. And so the ability to kind of switch gears from not only just case management or resource provision, but also to be able to be a clinician and a therapist if they need to be, somebody who's able to uh, really provide support and link with resources, somebody who's going to be able to not just focus on the limitations but the capabilities, and ensure and recognize that there are ways that you can age gracefully, there are ways that you can age meaningfully, and that there are ways that you can age with a quality of life. And so if you've got that total package, um, or even just a, a large majority of that total package, and then the personality and the energy to boot, as well as, as, as uh, Peggy's mentioning, you know, you've got to knock down a few different doors to get through here. Like we find, and, and, and again, I'm very fortunate with our team at AFA that we're, we're kind of pushing through and trying to push people's um, stereotypes of what it is to work in this population, the stigma of this population. And so I'm looking for, you know, somebody who's a little sassy, a little bit of a spitfire, because I, I think we need that, especially as the population ages, especially as the population is going to demand these types of changes. Thank you. Peggy or Susan, what professional organizations are you part of, and what other affiliations have you made to facilitate your professional development? Go ahead. Well, NASW, of course, um, and then particular, and it, and it's you have to kind of pick and choose because they're expensive to be mm -hmm. in them. Um, so I'm part of the Social Work Hospice and Palliative Network, which is a uh, national organization because that's really um, my field of practice but there are lots of other um, things you can do so you can read read articles and journals um, and then there's for those of you that are interested in the intersection of palliative care and geriatrics there's a blog called Jerry Pal G E R I dot P A L which is free so there are lots of there's a list serve for the hospice and palliative care there's a list serve um, for uh, the Association of Oncology Social Work. Um, so that's another agency that I, another place that I belong to. Um, but you have to kind of pick and choose what, um, what's the, the best. There is a geriatric care manager um, network. So there's lots of things out there, but there's blogs and listservs that some of them you can get on for without paying. So, um, and just read keeping up with the, with reading, even after you get out of school. I think that's an important thing, too. 
Peggy, would you like to Yeah, I don't really. Honestly, I'm um, also affiliated with NASW, um, CSWE, which is the Council on Social Work Education, um, so more generic organizations. I'm not really a part right now with any gerontology okay. organizations. The other place that's doing a lot of work with older adults and is the New York Academy of Medicine. Medicine. Oh, right. Um, which I'm part of, but um, again, there's so many things to be part of yeah. that get expensive. But yeah. uh, New York Academy of Medicine has lectures that are free mm -hmm. um, that you can go to, and a newsletter. newsletter. So you kind of have to Google things and mm -hmm. see what comes up. That um, I, I'm a part of NASW. That's our national organization. I have my malpractice insurance through mm -hmm. them. So I mean, that's an important one to be part of. And I think if you join as a student. It's less expensive, it's less right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that, that less expensive carries on for a couple well, of years. Right. Mm -hmm. There's also so, the American Society on Aging, and right, they have a national right. conference coming up, and there's been a big push to get more students involved, and it is a much lower rate for students, so it's coming up the end of March, it's in D.C., um, and they also, they've got some great mailings, and they do have webinars that are a fee, but if you are um, a member, you can get a reduction in fee, or actually, no, if you're a member, you get the webinars for free. And so the, men and the membership is fairly nominal with all that educational opportunity that you can have. Thank you. Margaret, are there any affiliations that you'd like to discuss? No, I'm not. So I, well, I am a member of the NASW. Mm -hmm. um, and as Susan said, can get a little pricey. So I'm kind of looking around. I'm interested in maybe eventually becoming part of the um, geriatric care yeah. manager. So it's being freshly out of school and just starting to work, mm -hmm. I've got to like kind of pace myself, but okay. that I, I was always a member of the NASW even as a student, so that just carried over and I continue. Great. Thank you. Maggie or Molly, what services do geriatric social workers offer? Um, you kind of touched upon it before, but if you can expand. So from what I do at my agency, there's um, I'm in the case management unit, so um, Meals on Wheels is typically what brings me into the um, senior's home. And basically there's either case management, there's linkage to resources, um, there our um, agency offers volunteer services for homebound seniors who can't get out, so there's um, also there's a lot of different things. Advocacy, um, we have an elder abuse unit because a lot, I'm coming across in my caseload that there are instances of elder abuse and because there is shame and stigma around that. Um, it's really working with the senior and trying to get them to understand that this isn't okay and that if you want to pursue having the abuser, you know, either taken out of the home or dealt with in a legal manner, just going through that, walking them through that process. Um, being someone who is supportive, so there's a lot of supportive counseling that goes on um, in the home. And um, I'm actually, actually my job, I'm beginning to work with, our agency is starting to work with some OT interns on the palliative care project. So we're reaching out to um, elders in the community who need palliative care to identify them mm -hmm. because um, for the most part if they're in a hospital then they're you know you know them but most of the time there are a lot of seniors that are in the homes they're isolated they need palliative care because they're dealing with arthritis diabetes all the things that Susan mentioned but they don't have any access to pain management or if they have pain management they're not really taking their medications properly there's a whole host of things so that really identifying them for palliative care and getting the interns in who can work with them and link them to services. So that's something that's happening that I'm very excited about. And um, there's so many things. I, I think what I really want to uh, convey is that for all the stereotypes that you hear about aging, there are a host of different avenues that you can go into as a social worker to deal with older adults and dealing with older, whether it's in the hospital setting. I was I was privileged to work at the VA last year, so that was with palliative end of life care. And so you're dealing with the, with the veteran who comes into the hospital and who then goes to long-term or hospice care. And you're dealing with the family, so there's also services that you would provide to the family. So it just becomes a comprehensive um, piece, which I'm really enjoying because typically there's a senior there 
Well, thank you for all of your insight and your inspiration. I'd like to op like to open the floor up to questions. Yes. So it seems that there is an abundance of jobs available, but I feel like I've seen a lot for me because I'm a second year and I do want to work with your managers, and I've done both of my internships working with older adults. And a lot of the positions that I'm looking that are available have a lot to do with case management. And then I'm not sure if you guys just are aware, I'm not sure you are, that um, Mayor de Blasio's, um, um, what is it, 37.5 million budget uh, doesn't have anything added with case management in that respect. So it's, it's interesting how there's an abundance of jobs, there's not enough people who want to work within the insurance policy sphere, but for those wanting to go on more of a macro level with geriatrics and advocacy. Um, what can you suggest as far as someone who is looking for employment after um, getting their degree? And what kind of suggestions can you give someone who's going more towards a macro level of thinking and not specifically just clinical or case management? Well, I can think of, I mean, this is very, you know, um, small, but I can think of like a couple of agencies that we've worked with here at the school that were macro in nature. One was the Council of Senior Centers and Agencies, Council of Senior Citizens, and it's which called Livon Live now. On. Yeah. 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 New York now called Live, Live, on. Live, Live on. on. New York. Live on New York. Council of Senior Centers and Services. It's called Live On? Live, Live on, on New York. York. Bobby Saxton's mm -hmm. organization? Mm -hmm. Bobby yeah, they changed the name. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. It's much easier now because you can just call Live On. Live on. Right. You don't have to worry about that information about the budget. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. It was from Live On. So, okay. I mean, that's true. Right. So, that was one place where we actually had a field placement. It was a macro placement. And the other place that we've had macro assignments, but not, not currently, was United Neighborhood Houses. Mm -hmm. That's the umbrella for all the settlements right. and all the. Um, so, but. But on the governmental level, I'm not sure um, so much. DIFTA? DIFTA yeah, might be a place, yeah. Right. I'm just trying to... Well, I think... Yeah, oh. Department of Aging. Yeah, Department, that's what I'm going to say, Department of Aging. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that, at least with uh, the Alzheimer's Foundation, what we've, what we've done is we have our education and kind of outreach and advocacy, which or our, our, our new, new Laura is here, uh, who filled that position. Uh, but to really work with some organizations and national organizations, um, I'm sure the Alzheimer's Association has one as well. PSS has their, has their new grant funded uh, through Cuomo's grant for caregiver resource, where they're really looking on educating and developing resources and understanding around uh, specifically Alzheimer's and dementia care, but brain health and wellness, early screening, Things along those lines, and so there are some sort of programs from an education standpoint that would probably be able to find. It. And you might want to look at the Medicare advocacy agencies, of which there are a bunch. That the names are sort of escaping my mind, but I think any healthcare advocacy yeah. agencies, mm -hmm. if you look, would probably have someone on looking at at older adult issues. Um, so I would certainly look at health advocacy agencies and. Medicare, there's like Medicare Rights Center, there's places like that that are doing work on a, on a more macro level as well. There's also a fantastic program called Reserve that's based out of New York and they do a lot of work to, um, around employment and engaging meaningful living for people as they age. So let's say somebody who's you know, retired, semi-retired, let's say he's working an accountant, they'll place those individuals, these reservists, in jobs and they also do quite a bit of um, Again, education and, and some advocacy, and they have various programs around the country now. Um, and so they might be a, an opportunity as well. Yeah. First of all, thank you guys so much. Um, as a volunteer at NYU Hospital for Joint Seat for the Social Work and Case Management Department, whatever you just said now applies so well. You know, we deal with a lot of older people, and it all that applies. And also, I do. Um, Water yoga instruction for a group of um, Holocaust survivors, and that population is dwindling. Yeah. And what you said about the stories, and mm -hmm. it's just so applicable. Um, about the older population in prisons, <coughs> what can you say about that? That's a good so, question. So, um, 
actually know something about that. Uh, the older population in prisons, there's a lot of there's a lot of chatter going on about that. And my background's in criminal justice, just again, just to yeah. show you how and completely you outside the, the yeah the scope of my current job is. Uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot of chatter right now around, especially dementia, well, what, what I'm focusing on, dementia care or lack of dementia care or recognition around Alzheimer's and dementia-related illnesses in the prison population. Um, and just with, as, with a lot of these type of specialties within prison population, there's not the best mental health care. There's not necessarily good recognition around substance use unless you're talking about, well, that's a whole other issue. Um, and so... There's a lot of chatter. As far as I know, there aren't too many organizations, but again, I haven't been focusing too much on it. Uh, that not too many organizations were specifically speaking right, to educating. And that's my that's perception. Is there a future for an organization like that? Or an organization solely working on advocating yeah, for individuals? Yeah, there are advocacy for women in prison, and there are for all that, but then there is an older population in prison, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. not look at that. Yeah. Is there a future for an organization who will, like, advocate? I think there would totally be a future. I think that there there would be a lot of uh, challenges, again, going back to that idea of those energetic, funky social workers that we can have who will bust down some doors. But that will add some fun to this prison. Oh, prison is so much right. fun. Absolutely. No, like yeah. for the new social workers. No, for real. If I, could, if I could go educate everyone in prison about dementia, I just have a new project. Noted. New there project. is a program. I'm yeah, sorry. There ahead. is a program called WRAP, which is Release Aging People in Prison, and they do a lot of advocacy work around mm -hmm. um, the elderly in prisons. How do you know, like, get them out earlier or something like that? Not only that early release, but then once they reintegrate back into um, the community, assisting them with services, getting mm -hmm. them linked up, you know, to services of that. So that's an organization I know that does a lot of work. Vera, Vera Institute and Fortune Society oh, yes. probably Fortune also be Society. places to look into to see what they're doing. And there also is a hospice movement in prison. It's really been very progressive for a while, and then it sort of has lost momentum. Um, major issues of people in prison with cancer, with pain, not getting pain, pain and palliation. Um, so that's that's a real cutting edge field at this point. I know California and Louisiana have yes, they two do. programs that are really um, for the hospice, hospice, and hospice. And Yeah, if you just write, if you Google prison and hosp hospice and prison, those yeah, programs, programs, will, those programs will come up. And those are two well-known programs. Um, that deal with that, where the inmates actually provide support. So yeah, the inmates, inmates actually care. Do the what we would call the home attendant work with their mm -hmm. fellow prisoners. Wow, but, the, but the biggest yeah. problem is um, the number one, you know, medication that people use for pain is morphine, morphine. and mm -hmm. getting that into a prison has been, is a real yeah. issue. Right. So there are real advocacy issues around people who are, have pain and are ill, but are living in prison, people who are not going to get out of prison. There's the whole issue of determining what's called capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and older adults are vulnerable to being deemed to not have capacity without it really being true. So the capacity standard means that um, to have capacity, you have to understand the decision to be made. You have to understand that you have a choice. And you have to understand what the ramifications are of not doing it. Sometimes when, when older adults are deemed a non-compliant because they don't want to do something, um, people begin to say they don't have capacity when they do. 
the biggest issue with capacity and what you really have to be really clear about in your field placements or wherever you're working with an older adult is that if the client has capacity to say, yes, I will take the medication, then they have capacity to say, I won't take the medication. When, but they never talk about capacity when the client is, as I said, the medical language is compliant. So if the older adult has been taking their medicine for months and then decides, I don't like the way I feel on that pain medicine or I don't really want to take that medication anymore, all of a sudden people start talking about capacity where two weeks ago they weren't talking about capacity when the person is taking it. So there's a real role in, in the bioethics world um, for social workers looking. Um, and capacity is, is, is determined by decision. So you may have capacity to say, I want breakfast at 8 o'clock, not 9 o'clock, but you might not have capacity to understand the ramifications of not taking your blood pressure medication. But people are very quick to be paternalistic with older adults and say they don't have capacity. And um, social workers have a role in helping look at capacity um, in, in older adults. The extra layer to that comes with dementia. Yes. And dementia other cognitive impairments as well because, you know, there are so many complexities where at one moment I can say, absolutely, yes, these are my decisions, and tomorrow I might not be having such a clear day. That's right. Um, and so it's really tricky and there's a lot of, um, we get on our, we have a, a helpline and on our helpline we get a lot of calls. Uh, we've had a lot of experiences around, well, my dad, especially when it comes to, there's a lot of sexual concerns, dad is speaking with this other woman, somebody climbed into this other bed, do they know what they're doing, is this a sexual, uh, like, kind of deviant act, or is this just confusion, um, if there is sexual intercourse between two residents in a facility, let's say, well, does mom really know what she's doing, I'm not sure, yes, she is, and then family gets involved in stress, and we don't know from moment to moment what may be going on in that person's mind because it can change moment to moment due to the dementia. And so it gets really tricky. Mm -hmm. um, it gets really complicated. It's a very big hot button issue. Uh, when it comes to how we like to talk about um, decision making for individuals living with dementia and their families, it's as the earlier you can have these conversations, the better. And as often as you can have these conversations, so we're actually having a um, teleconference Thursday around advanced care planning when it comes specifically to dementia. It's a free phone conference we do monthly um, because it's important, especially upon early, this is why we like early detection, uh, memory screening, early diagnosing, so we can understand, okay, there's a situation happening with dad um, and the family has an opportunity before it becomes a crisis to really talk to dad as with any type of advanced care planning, mm -hmm. right? Finding out the health directives. So we can talk to that individual and get their understanding and then continue to have open dialogue around as, is the, as the disease progresses. This is what's gonna happen with you now that you have Alzheimer's, this may happen, this is what it could look like. Having those conversations often and ensuring all those are on board um, doesn't necessarily solve the capacity issue, right. but at least we're a little bit more educated in understanding of what the individual wants as well as, you know, what the family may want, what their concerns are, so the more prepared we can be, the better. But well, it's, it's yeah, especially when I share it, it's like so not clear cut and it's constant confusion, um, especially on some of these other buttons. It's true with older adults with a history of chronic mental illness. Yeah. That does not mean you don't have capacity. So, but if they go into a hospital and that gets on their chart, um, very often people will begin to speak to them as if they don't have the ability to make a decision and so that we have to really be vigilant about that. It's a real social work, it's a great question, it's a really important issue. And I'm sorry, it's just, it's so layered too. It is. Also then you could say like dad has capacity and then we were talking about, about adult children because one adult child would be like no this isn't what she wants, the other one oh yes that is what she wants and then you've got the whole fight family dynamics involved in it um, and then if it's on a medical record, not on a medical record, I do want dad on this pill, I don't want dad on this pill, I mean it's so, so like amazing, rich, fantastic clinical work. Yeah, if you're going to work with older adults, you have to like family work. Yeah. Yes. And you have to like working across disciplines. Yeah.
So that can, that can get really tricky, and I can I use this example in a lot of the training that I do, and it, it, it's a personal example. My grandfather was 96, and he decided he wanted to go ahead with quadruple bypass surgery. You know, that sounds like a really smart thing to do, and for him, that was his choice, and he had the capacity to make that choice. My mom and my, my aunt fighting, 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 all this other stuff. It was, Molly, you gotta come, you gotta come to town, you gotta see your grandfather, this might be, this might be it, uh, type conversation. And I went there and I said, hey, Papa, how are you? And he said, you know, no one's asked me that in a month. Mm. And I think that that, to me, says it all. That we need to remember as social workers, right, especially, but also as, as human beings, to stop for a second and perhaps if the family has an opportunity where they're all going and getting a coffee or whatever or just, you know, encouraging the family. And we, we talk about this quite a bit at AFA, remembering that there's still a person here, whether they have dementia or not, um, remembering that a patient is still a person. And so, how are you? How are you feeling about all this? It seems like there's a lot there's a lot happening. And just finding that space to pause and be like, and check in, which again, it's kind of like our basic social work and our basic human nature, but we get so busy and it can get so chaotic. But remembering as social workers that we, we have that ability to like hit pause and be like, hey, what's happening? And I ended up having a fantastic conversation with my grandfather that no one else would have had it, but no one stopped and said like, hey, hi, what's happening today? Because again, we get so busy as social workers and like, how, you know, how's your pain? How are you feeling? Oh, this one's saying this and that. Chill out. What's happening? Hi. So I, I like to use that example because I think when there's a lot of chaos, especially when there's drama involved and there's a lot happening and it's all really scary for the family members to not forget the person, the person who's actually experiencing all of this in their body and, and checking in with them.